Good evening, everybody. Hope all is well. Pray you're having a blessed and wonderful Wednesday. Uh, we're getting on a couple minutes early as usual. Try to let everybody get on and join in for tonight's uh, different Bible study. So I'm excited about it. my beautiful brides coming in by me here. Hope all is well. I see we got somebody watching, but they ain't let me know who yet. If y'all will, go ahead and hit that share button as well. I'm going to do it on mine as I'm thinking about it. Hey, Sister Ashley, good to have you with us. Brother Mike Sanders, how you doing, my brother? Praying all as well. There he is, Brother Walter Sykes. Good to see you, my man. Hope all is well. Brother Mike Sanders, we're praying for you, man. I know you got an um, important talk coming up this here soon with uh, the Promised Land, so uh, we're going to be praying for you on that. Brother Bruce Hale, good to see you, my brother. Hope all is well. Hope everybody's staying cool and hydrated. It has been hot this week and humid. Told somebody today I felt like I was drowning in, in midair. We are going to be talking on a subject tonight, praying for a visit or preparing for a visit. And uh, it's going to be a little different tonight than normal. I got my go go juice. Sister Debbie, good to see you. Sister Debbie's usually the first one on, but I think they might be out riding around in that new truck. That's right, yeah, definitely the rain was just added to it. If you guys will just reach down there and hit your share button, share it with somebody that might get something out of it. Sister Janet Lancaster, good to see you, my sister. Hope all is well. Hope y'all are holding the big pelham down. <clears throat> Brother Chris Mack Campbell, MC Campbell on the stage. Good to see you, my brother. Sister Chastity, good to see you. Sister Chastity is a proud mother of a Deshaun who had just uh, signed to play some college football, so we are excited for him. Brother Steve Lawler, good to see you. Hope all is well. Um, quick announcement. While everybody's still getting on, uh, I talked with Pastor Jason and Nikki Esteron, and uh, we will be starting our children's church with reserves, <clears throat> but it'll be starting back this Sunday. Um, so uh, bring your kids, and uh, we are excited about starting that back up. Of course, we're going to be taking um, very um, strict precautions to make sure that there's no spreading of germs and make sure everything is sanitized and ready, but... Uh, we're excited about getting our kids back in kids' church. So I know they're ready. We'll give it about another another minute or two, and we'll go ahead and get started. Sister Jamie, good to see you. Thank you for getting on. I know I seen Bruce get on earlier, but he said it wasn't his job to make sure everybody else got on. <laughs> That's the inside joke. Sister Crystal, good to see you. Thank you for getting on and joining us. All the way from Ashburn, Georgia. <clears throat> Sister Melissa Ingram, good to see you. Good to see a bunch of familiar faces we ain't got to see in person in a while, but so good to have you guys on our live with us. Um, uh, hey, real quick, also one more quick announcement um, as we will be continuing doing our online 
uh, Wednesday night services, um, at least through the summer. And we're going to revisit it in September and make a decision there. Um, but next Wednesday night, we'll be starting a series on divine direction. And I invite you guys to be a part of it. It's going to be a, a good study, especially for the time in which we're living. Um, you know, if we're not careful, we'll, we'll lose focus of where we're headed. But we don't just want to go where our goals and our thoughts go, want to take us. We want to go divinely, uh, divine direction. We want that Holy Spirit to move and to guide our steps. And um, I'm excited about doing that study with you guys on divine direction. Sister Mary Lawler, good to see you. Hope all is well. Hope you're keeping Brother Steve straight over there. Tell Brother Cliff we said hello to you, Sister Melissa. We always enjoy seeing you, Crystal, when y'all get to come out. Tell the family we said hello. I guess we're going to go ahead and get started and uh, do it a little different tonight, but I'll explain all that here in a moment. We're going to open up with a word of prayer and, um, and just uh, ask the Holy Spirit to guide the rest of this night. Father God, we thank you right now for your blessings. Lord, we thank you for your hand of protection, Lord, even in the midst of the craziness and the circumstances in which our nation has found itself, God. Lord, it is evident that we wake up to new mercy and new grace every day, Father. And Lord, that we could easily get caught up in what's going on around us, but Father, it's great to know that we can just rest in your arms, Lord God. And we lay back into the palm of your hand, Father, and your word declares that no man can pluck us away there. So today, God, I pray for, I just pray for strength. I pray for encouragement. I pray, God, that that people's focus would be on you, Lord God, and not on um, political leaders, not on, God, the the men and women around us, but, Lord God, that our focus would be on you and what your word has said unto us, Lord. I ask you right now that you would just open up the windows of heaven tonight and pour out a blessing that there be not room enough to receive it. God, I'm asking you to guide my speech tonight, Father, that you would give me the clarity of speech, that I would speak, God, with with boldness, that I would speak with the strength that you have given me to, God, and that I would speak clearly that your words will be understood, Father. And I just ask you right now, Father, just move in this service as only you can in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Good to see everybody. Thank all of you for getting on tonight. I'm going to do something a little bit different. I want to tell you a story. <clears throat> it's going to be story time. So you get you a little comfy spot and get you a little pillow and don't fall asleep. But I want to share with you a story. And I promise there's a purpose behind this. And um, I'll share it with you at the end. So before we get into any scriptures, before we get into anything, I want to just share a story with you. And um, I actually got this idea from when I was a little bitty boy. I remember still to this day, I don't remember much about that age, but I remember clearly watching this Christmas play um, that a lot of my family got to be a part of. But I was, like I said, I was still real little. But I do remember it. And to this day, uh, my mom has it on VHS tape. So for some of you youth that are watching, that's a big uh, black thing with tape on the inside of it that we used to record with. Uh, but my mom still has it to this day, and I love to go back and watch it every chance I get. Uh, it's been a long time, but I I, it still rings clear in my mind. So I want to share with you this story tonight, and then I'm going to share with you the purpose behind it. But jumping right into it, um, there was a young lady, <clears throat> had a small family, um, didn't live didn't live high on the horse. She was, um, you know, there was a medium waist family, and um, she got um, a mail something a letter in the mail saying that Jesus Christ was going to be visiting her house in the flesh, and it it just blew her mind. She was she was bound and determined that this was going to be the greatest um, visitation, not only for them. But for Jesus Christ, when he showed up, they were gonna, he was going to know that they had prepared for him, that they, did, they took it seriously, that they wanted every ounce and every part of him to be welcomed when he showed up at the house. <clears throat> now, the mom was a stay-at-home mom, but the dad worked all day long, and he had just gotten home from work, and they were frantically. She had food going in the kitchen, and he was getting dressed, and um, she had a, a daughter and a son and they were uh, cleaning she had them cleaning the house and folding laundry and 
and doing all of these things. And they kept asking, Mom, why are we working like this? Why, are, why is it so important that our chores be done even, um, even greater? And why are you so you know, stressed out about this? And she said, you guys don't understand. We have one of the greatest visitors that could ever possibly be coming to our house tonight. It's Jesus. And they all just got excited because they had shared with them the story of Jesus and they knew him. So they were excited that Jesus was going to be visiting their house. Well, it was getting, it was, it was about six thirty, seven o'clock in the evening and uh, they were working frantically and they hear a knock at the door and the mother tells the daughter, she says, go answer the door and, and um, find out who that is, but make sure um, that you let them know that we're expecting a visitor tonight so we don't have time to do anything else. So the daughter goes and she opens the door and lo and behold, there's this elderly lady standing there. And she's got aluminum cans in a buggy. And she's asking if they had any aluminum cans that they could spare. She was collecting uh, cans so that she could make a little money for that week to buy groceries. Well, the mother walks up to the door and she says, Ma'am, I'm so sorry to tell you this, but we are expecting a huge visit tonight. And um, we would love to help you any other time. But right now we're going to have to ask you to move on down the road because we have to get our house in order and ready because we have an awesome visitor night. Jesus is coming to our house. And the other lady said, thank you for your time. I completely understand, I'll move out of y'all's way. And so she goes on down the road and they go back to doing everything, uh, getting everything ready again. Um, the dad's then got out of the shower, he's then, got, he's then got some nice clothes on and he's helping mom around the kitchen. And like I said, they're just working away. And lo and behold, they hear another knock at the door. They open up the door and it's two young men standing there and, and um, they have broke down around the corner. And uh, the dad says, can we help you? And he says, sir, if we could just use your cell phone, if we could get you to come down, maybe give us a jump. Our car broke down around the curve and we are really needing you guys um, to maybe lend us a hand. And uh, the dad said, man, I would love to help you guys. And, and I, I, I'm gonna send you down the road. There's a couple more people down here that can help you, but we're in the process right now of preparing for a visitor. We are excited about Jesus Christ is coming to our house. So I hope you understand that I'm not just pushing you away, but I've got to get things ready for Jesus because when he's coming, he's, he's got to be our, our focus. He is our center point. So he, he tells them that he can't help them and he sends them on down the road and they go back again and back to working. Well, about this time, it's about 8, 30, 9 o'clock. The food's been ready now for quite a while. And mom's steadily trying to keep it, keep it warm without drying it out. And you know how um, cooks get about their food. So they're doing things. They're all kind of sitting around the living room. They don't have the TV on. They then got the Bible out and laid it on the coffee table. And, and they're just discussing about how to act and how to, how to um, present themselves when Jesus shows up. They hear another knock at the door, and it is a young lady, young pregnant lady, and she's just wanting to know if they could help her get a motel room for tonight, that night because she's, she's due any time for this baby, and she doesn't have any place to stay. And they said, again, as they have been doing, we would love to help you, but we have a visitor coming tonight, and we don't have time to be going out and, and, and booking motel rooms and and, and taking people around town tonight, we are expecting an amazing visitor. Jesus Christ is coming to our house. So the lady says she understands, and they sent her on down the road to go ask someone else. And uh, about 10, 10.30 rolls around. The kids are getting, getting antsy, and uh, the mom finally says, y'all go to bed, and when Jesus gets here, I will, go, I will come wake y'all up. And I'll let, let y'all know to come out and meet Jesus. Um, the dad's sitting there. He has to get up for work the next morning. So the mom tells the dad, I want you, you go get in the bed also. Just keep your clothes on, but lay down in the bed, get you some rest. And when Jesus gets here, I'll be sure to come wake you up and let you know that Jesus is here so that you can meet Jesus face to face. So they all agree. And the mom's still sitting in the living room and she's sitting in a rocking chair and She's crocheting, knitting, drawing, you know, watching, hunting, whatever mamas like to do. And uh, so they're sitting in the chair. She's sitting in the chair and she hears a knock at the door. And she goes to the door and it is a young little boy who said that he has been walking around the neighborhood all night long. And this was his last house. He's only got three candy bars left. And he's really trying to reach his quota so that he can go on a trip with his school. 
Well, the mom is tired at this point. She's not being as nice as she had been. And she tells this child, it is too late for you to be asking us to be buying candy bars. Um, we are expecting a great visitor tonight and I don't have time to be trying to buy candy bars right now. I need you to please, please, please go find somebody else and leave our house alone. We need to pre prepare for Jesus. And the, the, the child goes on and leaves. So the mom goes back in there. She sits back down and the clock just begins to roll and the mom dozes off. And, and about 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, she hears a knock at the door. When she opens the door, there's a man standing there. And, and she said, can I help you? She said, have you been, he, the man said, have you been expecting me? She said, well, we've been expecting a visitor tonight, but who are you? He said, I am Jesus, the son of God. And the mother just went for him. She said, hold on, I got to go wake up my family, I promise. She said, he said, can I, can I ask you, why did you not let me in? And she said, Jesus, what are you talking about? We have been here all night long waiting on you. We have cooked and the food has done got cold. We've put it up. The kids have went to bed. We've cleaned and we've, we've, we've done everything we could tonight and, and to make every, this night perfect. So when you got here, you would see that we appreciated you and we wanted you in our home. And then Jesus said, but I came multiple times and every time you told me to leave. And she said, Jesus, well, you have not came to our house. We've not one time seen you here, and we never would have asked you to leave. And then Jesus told her and reminded her of Scripture. He said, ma'am, what you have done unto the least of these my brethren, you have done also unto me. And that woman just drained of, of all her, her life and her thoughts because she had thought, that she was doing the right thing by preparing for Jesus. But even in her preparation, in her idea of preparation, she cast out Jesus multiple times. The end. That's your story for tonight. I want to share with you some scriptures out of the book of Matthew, chapter 25. I'm going to start in verse 31 and go through 46. We're not going to talk about all of the scriptures tonight. I just want to give you um, one main point for tonight that you can go and you can take home with you and you can study and you can chew on it and let God speak to you. But in the book of Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, it says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. This is talking about the final judgment. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another. And as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was unhungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered and fed thee, or thirsty, and we gave you drink? When did we see a stranger and took you in? When did we see you naked and clothe you? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. I was naked, and you clothed me not. I was sick and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister unto you? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have did it not to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Very, very, very short and simple um, 
topic for you tonight. How have you prepared for the visitation of Jesus Christ? From the personal standpoint in your life, walking out in your ministry, walking out in your salvation, how many times have we stuck to the traditions and the man-made uh, doctrines and the man-made religions that show us or tell us we are saved? But in, in the midst of doing that, just like the story I just told you, this mother and this father and this family had all of the right intentions in their own heart and in their own mind in preparing their home for Jesus. But Jesus would much rather have walked into that house and seen dirty clothes on the floor, dishes in the sink, the grass not be cut, and the daddy still wearing work clothes, and know that this family would put all of those things aside and help someone in need. Minister to someone that is lost. Reach out to someone that is drifted. Restore someone that is backslidden. Give healing to someone that is sick. Jesus sent us for these works. But what, I'm, what I fear many of us have done, and we've all been guilty at some point in our life, if you've been living out a Christian life, we've all fell prey to this uh, busyness of trying to look like the Christian, that we have tried to prepare the world for Jesus. We've tried to prepare as though Jesus does not know when our house is dirty. We've tried to prepare as though we're getting a visitation because it's Sunday morning, so I've got to wear my Sunday's best. I've got to put on my, my suit and my tie, and I've got to shake hands, and i got to smile. You, it's bad enough that you got people that even on Sunday mornings can't even do that for Jesus, but then you've got people that only do it on Sunday mornings for Jesus. But in the end, they're doing it to look like something as though Jesus knows not where they are. This family was preparing for Jesus to come to their house. They were trying to prepare the world for Jesus, to give Jesus a hope or to give Jesus a sense of fulfillment or joy. But Jesus does not need us decorating the world because he's already said that when he comes back, he doesn't want this world. He died for the world, not meaning the, 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 the land and the water and the, and, the, and the trees. He died for mankind that we might be saved. But he's creating a new heaven and a new earth. He doesn't need us trying to make the world look good so he'll feel okay coming to visit us. David said, if I make my bed in hell, he will be there with me. Jesus is not looking for what looks good, what sounds good. And, and, and even in the, um, the everyday walk with Jesus, sometimes we get so caught up on trying to look good, we forget to be good. We try to look the part, we forget to play the part. We try to... Uh, look saved, but we forget to live saved. And the, the issue is, is God would much rather have you with dirty rags standing before him, knowing that you don't have what it takes to clean them. And you understand that I need the blood to cleanse my rags. He said, even our righteousness, even the things that we do trying to look good, even the things that we try to impress Jesus with, he said, even our righteousness are as filthy rags. But there's only one thing that makes us pure snow, and that is the blood of Jesus Christ. And Jesus tells us in the book of Matthew, when he is telling us about the final judgment, that there are, he, he tells us previously, that there are going to be many people that stand before God and they're going to say, but Lord, Lord, we cast out devils in your name. We prophesied in your name. We've done good and do. We, we prepared our house for you, Lord. We, we cooked for you and we folded laundry for you and we cut the grass for you and we did all of these good things for you. And we did it in your name, Jesus. And Jesus says that he is going to look at them. And he's going to say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. Jesus is not looking for what looks good. He is looking for what is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. He's not looking for people that know how to talk about Jesus or know how to post, a, uh, post about Jesus. 
Anybody, an atheist, a sinner, a murderer, a child molester can copy and paste scriptures to Facebook. They can, they can quote scriptures. They can read from a Bible. At the end of the day, he's looking for people that want to do good, want to be good, want to let Jesus be the good in their life. That is on our personal level. And I want, now I want to, to twist this real quick on our ch church level. The, 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 the full body. Um, the Bible says that he gave unto the church um, positions. And I'm just going to use the word positions because there's multiple positions that fall under the five-fold ministry. But he gave us a five-fold ministry. And he gave us men and women with callings to help strengthen people, to help build the kingdom of God. But I'm afraid, especially in Western culture, that sometimes we are turning away the pregnant lady needing a place to stay. The drunk man needing someone to give him hope. The sinner who is ashamed of his past. Who is on the verge of suicide because he can't live with the acts that he's done. And we're turning them away for the sake of making sure that our church looks excellent. Making sure that everything sounds... We've quit discipling leaders. We've quit creating uh, um, leaders. We've quit allowing people to be adopted into that discipleship and to be engrafted into this. We, we started telling people at the upper room, there's not enough room for you here. This is where Jesus told us to wait. Jesus told us to wait in the upper room. We, we're, you're not allowed up here. Go downstairs and wait for us there because we're in the upper room. We've we got to look good for Jesus. We're, we're, we're folding our dirty laundry as though Jesus can't smell the stench of our lives. We're folding our dirty laundry, waiting on Jesus while we're turning people in need away at the door. We're, we're, we're cooking food, sacrificed to idols, waiting for Jesus to come while turning people away at the door. We're, we're, we're using worldly means to, to shower the long, hard work day off of our lives, thinking when Jesus sees us, he'll know, oh, they're clean enough for me. But can I tell you, you can live in a cardboard box. You can reek of last, year, last year's Easter eggs, and you can, you, can, you can look like you ain't met a razor in the, in the time lifespan of your life. And Jesus is not going to look at you and say, oh, he's not ready for me. He's looking past all of those things. He's looking past the lights on the stage. He's looking past your ability to, to use enticing words or uh, to strengthen people with philosophy or cliches. The church, is, the church has more cliches than they have scriptures now, it seems like. We, we take the B clause of scripture and we create this, this thing without studying what the A clause is saying. We, we do this because we're trying to look good. And we don't get our affirmation from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because if we did, we would know that in order to be ready to stand before that judgment seat on that final judgment day, I don't want to be a goat. I want to be a sheep. I want to be found on the right hand of God because that's where Jesus went was to the right hand of the Father. And in order for me to get to the Father, I must follow Christ. I cannot find myself doing anything. Jesus ate with sinners. Jesus ministered to broken people. Jesus missed big name revivals so that he could go to, to, to talk to people at pools and, 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 and spit in, and mud and, and wipe it in people's eyes and, and call people down out of trees and, and tell them to be his disciples and, and things of this nature. That's what Jesus did. He didn't look at saying, oh, I don't have the spirit of excellence because I don't look good. The spirit of excellence is not about Looking the part. The spirit of excellence is about being the part. We, we, I, I'm a firm believer in giving everything your 100%. I'm not telling you don't ever clean your church again. Or don't turn the lights on. Don't buy another microphone. No. It's obvious that we can use these things as means to deliver the gospel. But at the end of the day, when I lay my head down at night, we have to be able to ask ourselves, have I done everything today to make sure that everybody I came in contact with, I treated them as though Jesus was in the room? 
We wouldn't have the problems we have in our nation today if Jesus was on our, the, uh, the forefront of our minds. We wouldn't have the dilemmas and the, and the division in churches and in politics and in states and in governments that we have today if Jesus was in the room. That song, I won't relent, or he won't relent, talking about Jesus. He, he won't relent. He continuously comes after us. And then there's a part in there that says, I don't want to talk about you like you're not in the room. But how many times do we do that? We pray to this long-distance God. We, we, we put a post stamp and we send him a letter that, that's got to travel so far away to get to Jesus when he said, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Where I go, he goes. Where I stand, he stands. Where I fail, he's there to pick me up. Where I, where I, where I move, he's moving. I don't move. God doesn't move. You know, we say we want to move of God. God doesn't move. He just entices us to move in God. Because God is omnipresent. He can't move. He just moves us in Him. And, and, and going back to Matthew 25, or actually previous to this, when He said that many will say, Lord, Lord, we've we done this in Your name, we've done that in Your name, and He will say, Depart from me, you work of iniquity, for I never knew You. He's not talking to the world, church. He's not talking to to strangers. He's not talking to sinners. He's not talking to, to drug addicts and, and rapists and murderers. He's talking to people that was living their whole lives in church. But they were so busy preparing this world for Jesus, they didn't prepare themselves for his kingdom. But Jesus has already came to this world. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he sent. Where did he send him to? His, to this world. His only begotten son. That whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. We're not in the business of getting the church, the local building that we are in. We're not in the business of getting that on the map. We're not in the business of, of being the next hot topic on TikTok. We're not in the business of, of creating the strongest YouTube channel. We're not in the business of doing those things. We here at Northwoods, we use those things. We use them because they're tools. But at the end of the day, if we're not coming together and having prayer, if we're not coming together and reasoning, if we're not coming together and developing discipleship opportunities, if we're not coming together and building people up for His kingdom, if we're not coming together and figuring out how to make leaders, if we're not coming together to figure out how to bring unity to our communities, then I don't care about all of those other things. I don't care about the, 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 the likes because the problem is, is if I get my affirmation from man, I'm going to be looking for likes. I'm going to be looking for how many followers we have. I'm going to be looking for how many views we've got. I'm going to be looking for all of those. Those things are great. Those things are nice. And don't please don't take me wrong as though I'm attacking the fact that you, you might utilize those things. We use them. What I'm getting at is my success is not based on whether or not I have the attention of the world. My success is based on have I answered what Jesus told me to do. Am I delivering the gospel with love, with truth? Am I delivering the gospel from transparency, knowing that I'm no better than anyone that I will preach to? I must be like Paul and say, I am the chief among sinners, but I boast in the Lord. I don't boast in myself because I'm a failure. I failed. I was terrible. I was a wretched sinner. But I am who I am because of God. He is the one that blessed me and called me out of utter darkness into his marvelous light. So imagine standing today, right now. What is today's date? June 10th. Imagine Jesus said <clears throat> in this moment that I'm going to judge you for all things would you find yourself on the right hand or would you find yourself on the left? Would you find him telling you, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I needed shelter, you brought me in. When I was broken, you healed me. When I was sick, you visited me. When I was in prison, you came unto me. You never left me. Because that's exactly what Jesus is doing for you and I. There's nothing that we go through that he's not there with us.
He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you, but I'll be with you even until the ends of this earth. And I challenge you to do something for me tonight. And I know it won't be popular, especially here in the South, especially here in, our, in the Bible Belt. Can I ask you to just think about, pray about doing me a favor tonight? Can I ask you to pray that you don't get caught up in the confusion and the arguments and the big, big bickering and the bitterness that is being spread abroad our nation today over right who's right and who's wrong, what should have been done, what was justice and what wasn't justice, and get caught up in saying, what if I done my part to feed the hungry? And I'm not talking about just physical hungry people. I'm talking about looking past barriers, looking past borders, looking past races, looking past genders, looking past ages, and saying, I am here to feed the, the hungry flock of the kingdom. Because what did Jesus tell Peter? Do you love me, Jesus? Do you love me, Peter? Yes, Jesus, I love you. Okay, Peter, you love me? How about this? Feed my sheep. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Christ's purpose is to fill his kingdom, his hungry children, with those willing to work, those willing to sacrifice, those willing to serve. Can I tell you that when you got saved, you didn't receive your crown. It's being prepared for you. You will receive it. Paul said, I have finished my course. Now there is wait up prepared for me a crown of righteousness. You haven't, you, when you got saved, you didn't receive your crown. You know what you received? You didn't receive your title. You received your towel. And you were to, you were to take your tie, towel, drape it over your arm, walk out onto the dinner floor and begin serving. Begin serving the meals. Begin serving the drink. Because at one point, you needed someone to serve you first. Because no man can be saved lest he be drawn by the Father. Somebody had to serve you first before you could ever be a servant of the Most High God. So can I encourage you? As hard as it may be, you're going you're gonna to have friends that are going to look down on you. You're going to have, there, there's different names out there from different cultures that call you when you betray your kind. Listen, I ain't white, I ain't black, I ain't green, I ain't yellow, I ain't orange. I'm, I'm a blood-bought child. I, have been, I, I ain't a Greek and I'm not a Jew. I'm not a Gentile. I am a blood-bought child of the Most High King. And don't you think that if, if he could save me, that he could save anybody else? If he could save you, he could save anybody else? You were worth saving. And it wasn't because your house look good or your clothes were folded or your beard was trimmed or your hair was fixed or your tie was on straight or you wore a suit to church on Sundays or you sang a red back hymnal song or you sang a new praise and worship song or you you was a minister what matters is did you obey his commandments love your neighbor as you love yourself love the Lord God with all of your heart your mind your body and your soul these two are the same. He said, and upon these two, you can hang all of the law of the prophets. That you have loved the Lord God with all of your heart, mind, body, and soul, and that you have loved your neighbor as you love yourself. We are hungry. The reason this world is, is so crazy right now, it's not because hell is that powerful. It's just because Christian leaders have started trying to dress the world up to look good for Jesus instead of letting Jesus dress us up to look good for the world. Because the world is, is where they are. We, Jesus doesn't want anything in this world. He said this world's going to pass away. He's making a new heaven and a new, a new earth. So if I'm doing what God, if I'm letting his commandments and that love resonate inside of me, I'm going to become a fruitful tree. You can take an apple and you can tape it to an artificial tree and call it a fruit tree if you want to. But if it's fake, the apple will die because there's nothing to feed it. So remember, you will know a tree by the fruit it bears has nothing to do with how dressed up you look, with how good you play the part, with how big you can talk about ministry. You want to show me the true fruit of your tree? Show me what you do when the hungry is around. Show me what you do when you know there's a need. Is the pride bigger than the need? Is the pride bigger than the forgiveness? Is the pride bigger than offering the opportunities? If so, 
It's not an exact, it's not an opportunity, it's not a time for you to condemn yourself, be condemned or to be cast off. It's time for you to just turn it over to God and let Him have control and lead you, guide you, and direct you. And work while it is day, because night cometh when no man can work. Thank you for tuning in tonight. I, I really hope that something was said tonight that blessed your soul, that, that really maybe resonated with you and gave you an opportunity to be that Christian that true Christian, that Christ follower, that that I'm American because I live in America. I'm Christian because I live in Christ and he lives in me. So if you're a Christian, do you live in Christ and does Christ live in you? If so, have you let him in your house when he knocked on the door? Revelation said, I stand at the door and I knock. And any man who opens, I will come unto him and I will sup with him. Jesus is not going to kick your door down and get in your house. He wants to be allowed in. He wants to be let in. Because if you willingly let him in, then you have willingly given over your power to his will. And his will becomes yours. So I pray that something was said for you tonight. I pray that you were blessed. So just ask you, do you have anything that you want to share tonight? All right. Well, I want to say thank you guys so much for tuning in. I pray that you have a blessed evening. I pray that you have a blessed rest of the week. Please stay cool out there. Stay hydrated. And uh, we love you. And if you can, and if you, if you are comfortable with it again, use your precautions. Um, there's no judgment here. So please do it the right way. But if you are comfortable with it, we would love to have you come join us this Sunday morning at 1045 at Northwoods Church. We'd love to have you in service. We will start, our lit kids will be having their service as well with precautions and um, strict procedures. But we are at least getting it started back. So we hope to see you there. God bless you. We love you. Have an awesome night. God bless you.